And when it came out of the dye vat, it looked like a, um, a remnant of a walkabout, like a pink mascot or, or right. like uh, some kind of puppet vomit. Like it was horrifying. And it was so, it was like, okay, that was $1,500 down the drain plus the, the cost of having a professional dyer work on it. Welcome to the Art of Costume Blogcast. I am Spencer Williams, and thank you so much for joining me for another extra special bonus episode. I am beyond excited to introduce you all to today's guest. You would know her for her work on Charlie Countryman, Hard Candy, and she designed the costumes for I, Tanya, for which she won a Costume Designers Guild Award and was nominated for a BAFTA. But today we're talking about the costumes for the new Netflix film directed by Andrew Dominic and starring Anna Diarmas as Marilyn Monroe. We are talking about Blonde. I'm so excited to introduce you all to costume designer Jennifer Johnson. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Of course, I'm so honored to have you. So first, let's get into it. You're designing yeah. costumes for Marilyn Monroe. Uh, that pressure. I mean, what is that even like? How do you even, as a costume designer, when you're approaching that, that must be like one of the ultimate daunting tasks. It is a, a terrifying <laughs> task. <laughs> it's so terrifying, and um, and and namely because you're you know you're following in this incredible Hollywood history of the most amazing costume designers who created incredible looks for her and knowing that you are having to, you know, take the baton and then do the honor of giving those designs the ultimate respect that they deserve and not just kind of absentmindedly going through the motions, making a copy. Cause it is so different just copying something and then actually right. sort of like kind trying to get into the mind of that designer and how they approached the, the construction of it and you know how they approach the materials and you know and how they approach the tailoring and all of that was really interesting to me and then how do i also make it my own in a way where i'm now i'm working in the 21st century and i'm working right. with Anna de Armas so what is that kind of balance um searching for you know simulation and and a copy versus also like Yes, copying and simulation, but also imbuing a spirit into the costumes that they so deserve to honor, you know, for instance, William Trevia, you know, like he right. <laughs> incredible. So I feel lucky um to to uh get into his mind a little bit. Yeah, it's an interesting line between like honoring some of these incredible costume designers like William Trevia, which I'm actually gonna talk to you about soon. And then, like, making your own mark, which I really feel like you did with this film. Um, it's an interesting line, though. Definitely very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So this film moves through the life of uh, Marilyn Monroe, Norma Jean. But first, mm -hmm. I'd really love to talk about your research process. Um, obviously, there's a plethora of resources for you. Um but I mean, is there too much research? How did you get into this? <laughs> there is so much research that on my Instagram, for instance, it knows that I like Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. So I'm part of that Marilyn Monroe algorithm. Once you start, it doesn't end. And to this day, there are occasionally photos I've never seen before. And we did wow. the movie in 2019. The director, Andrew Dominic, came to the project after had working on it for 10 years. He had 800 page document. Uh, with his own references. So there was that. There are so many books about her. She had such an amazing relationship and friendships with various photographers. Um, there is a lot on her, um, which is very interesting. You know, imagine if she was alive today in the day of Instagram and stuff, right. then she would have been the ultimate, you know, <laughs> yeah. influencer. So back to the to the kind of research process, uh, definitely. Andrew's document, which became known as the Bible, affectionately to the crew. <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, sometimes not affectionately. It depended on what was going on that day. <laughs> and, you know, I, we printed it out. It was in the production office. It took up 
I should have, I mean, it was like many, many, many f- yards or feet of, <laughs> of the Bible. And we had it, uh, our office is at Western Costume for the costume department. And we, we put it up like wallpaper in our office. <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of that, I had to do a lot of my own research because there was, there were bridges to gap, you know, like within there was his, his research, but then there was also research that was important to answer unanswered questions. There's a particular book that I, I want to say I, I maybe ordered it on eBay, but I'm, I'm, I can't remember where I got it, but there's a Christie auction house book that's incredible. And if there's any super fans out there, um, it is her estate and the way it's photographed is very clinical. You know, the pieces are laid out in an archival manner on a white background, you know, uh, taken very kind of clinically and they're great photos because you, you see them as objects and they're not on the body. And it's kind of fascinating to see underwear and her different effects and, like her lipstick case and things that maybe you don't see in the movie, but helped me kind of get into her inner interior, which is what the book is about that just Carol Oates wrote, which is what our movie's based on and, right. and Andrew's script. And it really is an interior life of um, Marilyn. And so, so much of that interior is in Anna's incredible performance And I feel like it was really my job is to not only take care of these recreations that are so important, that they be so beautiful and, and as rich as we remember, you know, like the, in in Technicolor, like it was very important that all the costumes really felt right. And then if somebody like William Trevia saw it, I would so hope that he would approve (laughs) and it was on my mind, like he was on my mind a lot. So there's not only that, like there's things that you in the movie you have to take care of, you know, there's beats that you have to meet, right? Like she has to have gentlemen prefer blondes, diamonds are girls, best friend number, have the pink dress. Like there's things in the movie that have to happen. And then outside of that, there's her uh, off duty life as Norma Jean. And then, you know, that was conversations that Andrew and Anna and I had about, you know, what was that? And how do we create a uniform and and from her personal life in history, like maybe what was that? And so some of the research really was sometimes just to like, like I said, this sort of Christie's auction house book was just sort of like to start living with her and trying to kind of conjure up her spirit, which we all did. And Andrew definitely feel like there's probably some seances going on. Yeah. you know, I feel like all the, there was so much love for her. There is so much love for her and our crew and my costume team and every department loved her so much that I think part of that became sort of like a, a, a spirit transfer. <laughs> like we put so much love into each one of her pieces of, of clothing, you know, whether that was a Hollywood costume that she's wearing in a recreation or it's her, you know, capri pants and her black sweater, all of that had to have kind of an energy in it that felt really exceptionally personal because then back to the script and the book, it is her psychological interior. Right. So ultimately, even though you could say, Oh, that's all about the, you know, like that pink dress is all about the costume it is it's so much also about her and anna like getting into that in interior in a way that the costume could never be the elephant in the room I, right. you know <laughs> so it was almost like nothing could be a distraction yeah for instance like historically correct she would have much more pointed bra right she would have bullet bra tips and and then she, <laughs> she also would sew marbles or she would have marbles sewn into her you know dress so it gave like a very extended nipple and all of that felt really um for today you know at the t- time it was 2019 yeah. but 21st century it felt really fetishistic and it felt very um costumey and it it felt like um if we were really going to get caught up in 
that kind of minutia of like, oh, like her, you know, her breast has to be this shape to be exactly like Marilyn's and, at, and her hips have to be this width exactly. If we got caught up in that kind of detail, I think that you would start feeling like the dress is wearing her, wearing Anna. You right. Know, that was never, you know, it was extremely important that Anna felt quite free in all the clothing, you know. So there was a there was some deliberate, intentional tweaks that are they're not big, but they're they're there. Right. It's all about like supporting that characterization too and helping yeah. Anna feel like she's becoming the character at the same time. Yeah. Um, and not taking over the room, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> and that pink dress, that bow on that pink dress could easily become the elephant in the room. Right. Well, I mean, actually, let's talk about the pink dress because it's on the list. Uh, because it is one of my favorite costumes from the film. Um, mostly because, I mean, being a costume design nerd, William Travilla, um, obviously doing many, many costumes for Marilyn Monroe back in the day. So I want to just dive into that though. Like how do you approach a garment as famous as the gentleman prefer blondes look and, you know, kind of respecting as we kind of talked about this a little bit, but like respecting the previous work done by other costume designers, kind of making your own, but also still reminiscent of what we're familiar with. Because when you look at it, like, wow, like that could be the dress, but it's still slightly different ways that feel current and true to the story that you're trying to tell yeah um that dress is really that is his dresses are fun to talk about and i think they're all fun to talk about but there's this great book i don't know the title but it's this little slim volume and if if you love if you're a costume nerd you have to have this book because it's so fun to read because it goes into the construction anecdotes it's very anecdotal like fun stories and it and one of the things about that dress is that when they were making the movie and they're in pre-production and uh, I believe it's at Fox and her famous photo when she was Norma Jean, when she was doing modeling work of her laying on the red velvet and she's nude was leaked. And that came out like it was already out in the world, sort of, I think it was a calendar, but it it, it had leaked into the mainstream and that image got out there while they were in pre-production. So he had to redesign her dresses because they were too sexy, the studio. Oh. So they wanted to tone it down. And he had very, very little time to react to it. So he didn't have time to order the correct fabric. And, uh, you know, it maybe it wasn't the right weight. And he was just kind of um, improvising as he went along. And so he realized that the satin wasn't heavy enough and he didn't have the right materials on hand in his workshop at the studio. So he walked next door to the art department and there was pool table fabric. You know, the felt <laughs> that is on top of pool tables. Right. And he um, used that to back that dress. That's insane. I did not and know thought, that. He thought about doing that because we really, when you watch the, you're looking at it still, but you're also watching the movies and and seeing how Marilyn moved in them. That was extremely important because I think you can successfully copy a garment, but if the pattern is off a bit and if the construction's off a bit, it starts adding up. And then as she's descending the stairs, it might really not like just a tube, <laughs> a, pink, a pink tampon, like walking. I don't know. Uh, you know, like it just... It's it's easy to sort of like go wrong with that dress because it is like very seemingly very simple, um, you know, uh, with this insane like origami pa- like present <laughs> bow on the back. And the bow was actually causes problems. The bow kind of I'm sure yeah. when we were shooting it kind of. <laughs> deflated a little bit um it needed like its own compressor to pump pump it up um (laughs) but that is so it's so interesting like he had those same thoughts about the dress and you know and 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 the weight of it because we actually had some of the same issues so number one outside of construction was the color of the dress and so you're looking at stills and you're trying to find behind the scenes you know or you know, not behind the scenes, but often studio photographers would take, um, 
you know, the, the screen test fo- photographs where you see yeah. the change number next to it written on chalk. It's a very distinct pink. It's a very distinct pink. And so we had a sample and we had, we were lucky because a lot of the movie, we didn't have time for such things, but we were lucky to get with Chase Irving, the cinematographer and do a test on a swatch. And he was like, kind of like, wow, this is crazy in person. Like this looks like a match. But when we got on a camera, it was no match for Technicolor. Right. It was totally wrong. And oh, it was really pale. And it, cause they were doing, you know, like, I'm, I'm not, I can't speak his technical language, but <laughs> sort of, you know, they're probably doing um, some kind of post thing, but on set where they were looking at what, like when they grade it, what would a Technicolor, how do you give a Technicolor a feel with the punching the color up? Right. And so our our fabric, you know, my fabric that I had, the swatch like was so limp and pale. <laughs> and and I and we realized that we're like we have to go a hot pink, like garish, you know, yeah. fluorescent, almost like a piece of candy, you know, like something really uncomfortably sugary and uh, bright and something you maybe wouldn't use on camera because it could vibrate even like it was really bright wow <laughs> so we ordered uh from new york this exceptionally expensive fabric uh, uh satin that originated in paris or in france and i want to say it was like a hundred dollars a yard and we needed because of the bow and etc cetera, etc cetera, we needed i don't know like 12 yards or some amazing <laughs> expensive amount. And we dyed it and, and we were assured by everyone like, okay, yes, this can be dyed. It'll be fine. And when it came out of the dye vat, it looked like the pink Panther. Like it looked like a stuffed, it looked like cherry behind you. It somehow felt it itself <laughs> and it turned into like, almost like the pool table felt, you know, it was oh. like, it looked like a, um, a remnant of a walkabout, you know, like a pink, mascot or, or right. like uh some kind of puppet vomit like it was <laughs> horrifying and it was so it was like okay that was fifteen hundred dollars down the drain plus like the, the cost of no. having a professional dyer work on it and we were really it's running whatever <laughs> completely running out of time so the amazing key customer allison wagner who's so incredible she had searched everywhere already and she's like okay can i pick a can it not be satin? And I was like, do whatever you need to do. (laughs) Please. And she comes back with this insanely hot pink roll of, it's almost like file and it's not right. And it would be really interesting to see if there's ever like one of those FIDM art of costume or, you know, uh, where they have those, if it's ever on display, everyone will see it and be like, what the hell? Right Right away. I'm the person who puts those costumes on display too. So. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So you would really appreciate. Like, there would probably have to be a note attached to it. Like, everyone, calm down. You yeah. Know. Take a step back. Close Take a one step eye. back. And it's this way for a reason. So one was that the color was that became paramount to everything. Like, and then in a way, the fabric didn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. As long as the, as long as Jose Bello, who was who was built and carry at Western Costume, were so amazing. I could go, we could have a podcast. We should have them on actually. <laughs> um, as long as as long as they were both comfortable with the drapeability of the fabric, like they're like, okay, it'll work. I, I get we'll make it happen for you. And they were kind of like, oh God, because it was it was different than what they were expecting. But ultimately that pink is so spot on. And that's what you see in the there's an amazing poster. I don't know if it's out yet, but we saw it last night at the premiere. And she's kind of sitting on the um, the red steps, you know that, and yeah. she was a little forlorn. And anyway, it's it's fun because that dress is right. a movie poster. I would love to see it. Um, and just and like the I love the pink because it really like it's you know the film has definitely its darker moments. Um, and then you see that pink and like just that like 10, 15 seconds of joy seeing that mm-hmm. pink. You're like, ugh. I guess that's I think a relief. It's an important contrast. And I think that's an interesting comment about the color, like, because that's a color she would never wear in her private life. And she right. was actually quite minimal and 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 subdued in her palette, um, and quite serious in her palette. 
there is a sense of this like candy, you know, ob- object like coming down those stairs. Like it's so exciting and yummy and, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I totally see what you mean. I mean, that's like almost how, you know, the world was seeing her at this point too. Yeah. So I feel that's why I love costume design, just storytelling through costume design, the color, what it says about the person. Yeah. I'm interested to hear it's a very personal, emotional, powerful film. I'm interested to hear about your collaboration with Anna Diarmas, actually, because this is a very, um, I'd say, personal project that you were working on. So what was that collaboration like? Exceptionally personal and 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 really Anna is like really exposing herself as an actor. And she is just really uh, committed and really going for it. And her performance is incredible. I've seen the movie twice. It is unreal, like, you know, especially when I first met her. And it was the same with Margot Robbie and I, Tanya. They haven't gone through hair and makeup when you meet them. And they don't look like those people, you know. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's, you just have to have sort of like a leap of faith that it's all going to work out. And obviously, you know, Andrew is an incredible um, image maker. And, and he's an incredible director. And he was very, um, really committed to to hiring Anna. And we had a camera test actually in 2018. So this for me goes that far back. And in 2018... It's been a journey. It's been a journey. (laughs) Uh, There's a reason when I first saw the movie, I I started crying because it was very cathartic. Like it has been a journey for the whole crew and for Andrew and for Anna, um, all that was involved. But in 2018, we had to do a camera test to, um, you know, we needed... Plan B, Brad Pitt and Dee Dee Gardner and Jeremy Kleiner, who are incredible producers, they needed to, you know, make sure that it was believable that Anna, dark hair, she's from Cuba, could she become Marilyn? And I think it's fair. It's fair that yeah. that a, a test was required. And I had half a day <laughs> to throw some things together. And what's so incredible <laughs> about returning back to that test is some of those pieces are in the movie and that's an, an incredible thing. Oh, wow. So the collaboration kind of, you know, that was sort of like my Andrew. I had never met Andrew, worked with him and I was kind of being tested. Probably it was a little bit of a tryout, like speed dating and <laughs> seeing if it would work out. But, you know, throwing together seven of her looks, kind of her day-to-day you know off-duty looks in like half a day and transforming Anna and getting the financing through that one test I think that that developed a trust with Anna and I in that one day or two days that we were working together in 2018 so when we started up again in 2019 I feel like we had this unwritten code that we we were there for each other and she was so committed to the fittings. I mean, <laughs> they were so many and they were so long because some of it initially was just figuring out, do we build prosthetics for her body? Does we have her, do we add weight? Do we change the shape of her hips? You know, there was a lot of exploration that we threw out within that and in the fittings and a lot of things that didn't make it. And she was so lovely in her commitment to never rushing those and, and it's exhausting you know fittings are exhausting i get exhausted trying on clothes like you know, you know it's right it's tiring like trying to, i'm exhausted for you just thinking about i know long right? process i know and so i think um like anna giving me the space also to figure things out with her was an enormous gift and we saw each other at the premiere last night for the first time we hadn't seen each other since the movie wrapped in october wow. of 2019 and we just oh. squeezed <laughs> for so long each other because it was like we made it we did it and it was yeah. it was really hard and that 14 minute ovation she got in venice I, so it's funny i say she I, that Andrew and her got, that the movie got. But in my mind, because after I saw the film, she's so incredible. I was like, that is for Anna. Like that (laughs) She deserves every... um, I mean, but it's also for... I mean, it's for everyone. It's for you. None of this would be happening without any of you, especially these costumes too. But meeting an actor, and you're so right. Like, obviously, you know, we 
you're always told like, don't be shy. You can talk about yourself. It's okay. <laughs> you can say it was good. Um, <laughs> It was good. <laughs> Thank you. It was good. <laughs> but, you know, having an actor that... Um, and really, all the actors in the movie were like that. They really w- were really collaborative. And they really um, dedicated a lot of their personal time to being with me in the fittings and really discussing things and living in the garment and walking through it together. And um, I think that's part of... I hope why there's sort of a naturalism to it is that every fitting that we had was extremely personal, you know, like even though that there's a million things going on and sometimes you only have time for Anna, there always was time given, you know, to all the other things going on. And even the background, my, the, the team, I had three people that, did the background full time and they fit every single person. And there's probably like 1900 background that have all been fit, you know? I mean, yeah, I was watching it and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is quite the project. And then like another nerd point I want to bring up too, is quite a few parts of this film are in black and white. And that is like its own challenge of costume. It's its own challenge, especially when, Andrew's not sure when we're going to use it or not. Yeah. So I, I feel a disappointment in because it's a question that everyone has asked me today doing this press junket today. And there's a little wildness working with Andrew. Like even though he's very, he's extremely organized and very methodical. And he came to this movie with his Bible and we, that really like, led was the always the leader in in the visuals and the discussions like it was always the jumping off point but there was a bit of you know working on the fly which i think creates a really interesting energy that you can kind of feel in the movie we didn't have much we didn't have enough time also and we somehow filmed everything in his script which is incredible and much kudos to him for keeping us on track with that but i think um Originally, the black and white was really mapped out for the recreations, you know, and so that was right. very clear. But as they were shooting um, and looking at dailies, I think that him and Chase Irving, the cinematographer, were like, whoa. And and for me, I have to say, like, it, the black and white, some of the stuff is my favorite. You know, it is. Yeah. There's things that we did that I can't even believe that it's in 2019 like it it looks so you know when you look at um for instance when she's on the airplane to go see the president or she's in the actor's circle um you know where she's studying acting and you look at her sitting there with the the background or um some like it hot when she's singing in the band I mean, <laughs> how is that now you know right and really satisfying i think there's like this really kind of cinematic quality visually that Andrew achieved with Chase Chase's help that is really cool. And I started I think they started feeling that when they were watching the dailies. And I don't think he wanted to be locked in, you know, so the, it is shot in color the whole film. I mean it could be changed over to black oh, and white. I see. But it's unnerving. And there were times when I would use my iPhone to look at colors and fabrics. And especially when I knew for sure it was going to be in black and white. And uh, you had to make up what the color was, right? Because the original photograph or movie is, you don't know what it is. So you were just like, I was always a grayscale, like taking a picture of this, you know, taking a picture of a fabric or a garment and then trying to convert that. And sometimes Andrew would be like, why is she wearing blue pants? <laughs> and I would show him my iPhone and then show him, oh, okay, I got it. Because yeah, his mind like, yeah, those are great. Um, so that, you know, that, that is really hard and and it is hard. it's hard to put your brain in that kind of gray scale um and i will say that the phone the iphone is so it's really helpful for that because it's such a quick little trick you know to yeah <laughs> i love that trick every time someone tells me they do that i'm like that's so crazy but i mean it just it works so i think your brain would have to be so advanced there'd be such an advancement in your brain i mean obviously if you were on doing black and white films all the time, you would have, you would, you would know, you know, offhand, but we live in such a color world that it, it's a new, new thing for our brain to, to think in that manner. 
Yeah. And, and also, <laughs> you know, some colors, that, you know, with part of her closet, like sometimes when I knew we were shooting in black and white, I might change thing, something that we had prepped to be in color. If I could, I would change it to something that looked better because, um, for instance, like red, if it doesn't have enough black and it can go very, uh, <laughs> limp and a little flat. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. things you have to think about. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, there was just like so many moments where I was watching it, especially during a black and white scene. So it was just felt very like transformative, right? Like kind of like shake your head like, oh, like this did feel like I can't believe this is 2019. I totally understand yeah. what we're saying because I had that several times and yeah. the transformation is just so real. I only yeah. have a little bit more time. So I will fire off this fun question for you. Kind of. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> was there any one costume you were excited to create? And was there a costume you initially found intimidating? The intimi- I'll answer the intimidating because that one's easy. Yeah. <laughs> really intimidating, like when you're just sort of theoretically talking about it, was the Some Like It Hot when she's singing in the band. Uh-huh. Um, that was... That dress is made out of a uh, souffle chiffon and silk and then oh. it's all beaded and those beads are heavy you know so there's like a lot of the dresses so can like whole lot going on there just with like the the fabric and how naked she looks in that dress and mm-hmm. also how so to back way up we chose Anna and I chose not to pad her overall because okay. it, she was so hot she had a wig on and it was too much and you know yeah we were shooting in, you know, August, September, and October, and that's always hot in LA. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the t- trick was um, our seamstress Lydia came up with this brilliant idea in the fitting of just getting a, a little piece of elastic and making it into a belt. And she would wear that on her bare waist every day. And that little bit just helped. And that's what she just wore that little, little lip of a belt and the little elastic was always hanging in her in her trailer and 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 she would put that on and that just did enough and then we had the bra that built her out a little bit but that dress to go back to this some like a hot dress was so naked that you then were aware of kind of how tiny Anna now Marilyn was tiny also but when she did that movie um, which was 59, I think she had in some weight and she was really like fully in, you know, she wasn't doing okay. And on that movie, that Billy Wilder movie is fraught with problems with her with drug addiction and different problems. So her shape was like different in that movie for sure. She's kind of bloated and, um, I mean, she looks gorgeous, but how do you do that? How do you like give her a little bit more voluptuousness without having then to add a prosthetic to her whole face and arms and because the dress is sleeveless. And so that is one garment that we decided to try to pad to just add a little bit. And Rory at Bill Hartgate did an incredible job with his team and there is a pad like sewn in as part of that of that dress um so that was probably the the most like how are we going to pull this off kind of thing yeah, it's a daunting task <laughs> very daunting and then the pleated dress you know the one in seven year itch that blows up in the subway grate yeah. that was probably the hardest dress to make in many ways because it, it on paper looks really easy and you've seen recreations of it they have it at the costume houses yeah. You've seen people in drag, you've seen them on Hollywood Boulevard, you've seen it at <laughs> right. studios. You're so familiar with the dress that you're like, oh, it's a, it's kind of like a little sundress. And then you start digging into actually how it's constructed. And it's so much work. And the amount of hand work and hand sewing and the and, and the amount of fabric that is actually in that skirt is tremendous. The, the it ended up being three separate panels and they all had to be pleated you know and and that pleating there's only like two people that i know of in the united states that still do it where they make <laughs> warm they make a mold and they they heat the fabric and it's then um per- permanently pressed into the um garment and even you know that pleating and and his father and him had made the dresses for years for universal studios and they're not exactly right they're right. great in their own right but they're not 
what trivia did. And so that was really the, the, um, the, the genius of Jose Bello um, at Western, like figuring that out with me. And then I decided to add a little bit more, even more fabric. So when the dress is blowing, it would really luxuriate and envelop her and almost like make her disappear. Um, and so that was a little bit of, of a reinterpretation. But the, a lot of the existing copies of that dress don't... Even if you look at Trevia's, they don't have enough um, fabric in the skirt. They're too... Right. They're very tame. <laughs> <laughs> Ours is like a max... Like a little steroid version of Trevia. I was going to say what I saw. I was like, this is like... This is a real deal type of... Like they clearly put all their thought and attention when creating this dress. So I, I saw that. I saw what you're and saying. And we... <laughs> you know, the terrifying thing is we didn't have time to to test it. So it didn't get tested until the day we shot. And oh, great. Yeah, that's encouraging. <laughs> we shot a real location. So originally that movie shot in New York and there was such a to-do about you know, because there was so much crowd around street, you know, people on the street watching the film being made and now talking about the original movie that um, it was too crazy. Like you could see too much of her underwear in the studios. Like we have to reshoot this and it's too loud and there's too much chaos. Like this is too, this is too much, yeah. too much. So they <laughs> reshot it at Fox back lot. And that's where we shot. Um, we used a lot of her actual locations in the movie. And I think that that does when you really know that it really it's just the production value of the list of where we, where she was and where we shot is amazing wow i can't even believe you went through all that i mean it really shows just such incredible attention to detail throughout this entire film i just really felt like you brought these iconic costumes to life it was just like really refreshing um, to me, the highlights of the film, just seeing these costumes come to life. But with that being said, it, you know, as we talked about, it was a very emotional film. Um, so just as a whole, now that you've seen it a couple times, what was your key like takeaway from this film? What do you feel like you walked away from this film with in terms of just the story and costuming? I, w I walked away um, feeling really excited to, it feels like a, real piece of cinema that Andrew has created. Um, it feels like a kind of movie that's not made very often anymore. It takes a lot more time and effort to make this kind of film. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, there's many great films being made. Um, but my point is, is it, it is kind of like an art movie. You know, it's sort of like when you think of David Lynch and Blue Velvet, or it, it has an edge to it that a lot of... Um, costume dramas or biopics do not have this this really takes that to a whole nother level um and so i love that it it has these moments of like classical old hollywood beautiful photography and luxuriousness of set design and costume design you know production design lighting but then that's also like there's this crazy punk rock Andrew Dominic spirit, you know, <laughs> and then you know, Nick Cave the score. And um it's 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 very there's just like definitely this cool, crazy psychotic um energy <laughs> in the movie that I think lends to uh electrifying this intensity of, of Maryland's interior. And I, I feel really proud to be a part of what Andrew created. And I also feel immensely cathartic that it's out and people are seeing it. What It's very divisive, the movie. People hate it. They love it. I love that people are talking about it. That's exciting too, you know? Right. People paying attention and regardless if they like it or not, I think that it's, it's, a, it's just a gorgeous film. And I think... Um, I think everyone involved like really poured their heart into it and we so wanted it to be great and the best and as you do on all projects. But I think this one was a bit different because we are paying tribute to Marilyn Monroe. We are paying tribute to the best in Hollywood of the, of a great era of, cin you know, of, of studio cinema, you know, in the fifties. And that, that was some big shoes to, to fill, but, um, I feel very proud of that. 
Right. It, it was just, I totally hear what you're saying. It was such a like electrifying energy and the energy I haven't felt from watching a film in a long time. It was just so yeah. artistic and detailed and yeah. it made me sad, but also like inspired at the same time. And a lot yeah. of that comes from your incredible costuming, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining yeah. the podcast. Um, oh my God, it's so fun. Congratulations. And so fun to talk to you. You know, your your questions are are make it easy. People have been interviewing me since 8.30 this morning and I'm cross-eyed. Oh. This was so lovely and easy. Thank you. Oh, of course. Yeah, you know, just a costume design nerd talking to a costume designer. I could talk to you forever, but... Um. Me too. I know this so well. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Jennifer. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you all so much for listening. Blonde is available now on Netflix. Go watch it as soon as possible. You're going to love it. The costumes are absolute dream. Thanks again to Jennifer Johnson for joining me. And thank you all so much for listening. The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted and produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Our audio engineering and editing is done by Dan White. Follow us on Instagram at the Art of Costume Pod or visit the Art of Costume Blogcast.com for all blogcast updates. If you want to support the show, go to the Art of Costume.com slash pod store. Or you can head over to patreon.com slash the art of costume for some bonus content. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, head over to the art of costume.com, a blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. incredible attention to detail throughout this entire film um thank you you're frozen or i'm frozen um uh, and i just love that dress too am i back uh, yeah you're back okay. now sorry <laughs> oh, no it's fine i was just complimenting you <laughs> i love it i'm sorry i didn't hear it <laughs>